Welcome back. So who's up for a history video today? It's Sunday and all that. So sure, why not? Uh, I made this board up yesterday uh, based on the discussion about how the game might be changing when it comes to some of the trick plays players are doing and whether or not that's good for the sport. Notice my fur furrowed brow. So, because, you know, you're always going to have people that say it's bad for the sport. It's bad. Change is bad. Sports, fine the way it is. Stop it. I can only imagine that those voices existed all the way through all of these changes. I can only assume that there were people all the way through that were dragged kicking and screaming to changes right up until uh, now. And, and that there were times where there were expansions and people were kicking and screaming about that. I would think that when the league went from six games to 12, there were very vocal people saying, we don't need six more teams in this league. It's going to water everything down. Terrible idea. LA. Nobody's going to watch hockey in LA. So I'm, I'm sure that there have been voices all the way throughout history. And so I wanted to talk about some changes and I went through the NHL's official page with rule changes. I went through ones that I thought were interesting. There are other, other rule changes, obviously, as well. I could fill four boards with it. But 1910-1911, the first one that really caught my eye is they went from two 30-minute periods to two three 20-minute periods. They also had like an intermission uh, halfway through each period. And so it, it was it was a longer game at that rate, I guess, although you wouldn't have had commercial breaks. So it might have been a shorter game. But yeah, two 30-minute periods. That would be ridiculous. And keep in mind, there weren't line changes in 1910-1911. When they show you team photos from back in the 1910s and 1920s, they don't have 30 players. They don't have two goaltenders. They have a handful of guys. They have a goaltender. And line changes, what are those? You would play the whole game. So it it was, I would imagine there there would have been a lot less speed to that game. But there were some serious differences in how it was played as well. So 1911-1912, the NHA, which would become the NHL. The only difference between the NHA and the NHL is Eddie Livingstone. That's it. The rules stayed the same. The team stayed the same. The owners stayed the same, minus Eddie Livingstone. They hated the guy. So they changed the name of the league so they could get rid of him. And that video being on the channel just makes me all warm and fuzzy inside because it is it is one of my favorite videos I've ever done. But they the NHA drops the Rover in 1911-1912. The Rover was there because, you know, the skill level wasn't where you might want it to be. And so the Rover would cover for the defense. The Rover might be playing forward. You could play anywhere on the ice. And now the Rover doesn't exist except in street hockey and floor hockey where when you ask somebody, are you playing defense or forward? And they go, eh, I'm a rover. Okay. All right. Got it. Cool. So you're not going to be back when we need you back. And you're not going to be at the forward spot when we need you there. Got it. Cool. Did you do it in the corner, Roven? Cool. Awesome. Great. Thanks. That really helps. Now, goalies had to keep keep themselves on their feet. Now, skating, it's, it's easy enough to stay on your feet. Skating around. Yeah, it doesn't take long to figure that out might be a little wobbly out there you can figure it out and the thing is when you're playing goal I would imagine it'd be pretty easy to fall over well goalies had to make themselves fall over and look like it was an accident because if they intentionally fell down to make a save they got a penalty for it until 1917-1918 so hockey existed as it was you know in the 1890s right through until 1917-1918 until goalies were allowed to fall down and I just, I, I, I like the idea of somebody back in 1917, you know, I could picture a really grainy film shaking their fist about how goalies in my day had to keep themselves on their feet. How dare they fall down? They look ridiculous falling all over the ice. In my day, you had to stay up and you had to make the save with your toes. Now, goal nets apparently were different in how they were made. I don't think there was a different size. I didn't see anything saying that they were anything other than the same size of goal net, but they had to be uniform in 1926-1927, meaning the posts had to be the same. I would assume they had to have all the same color. They had to be the same net, right? And they were fastened to the ice. So they were, they were fastened. Like if you ran into a net in the 70s, um, the only thing you could do at that point was send a bouquet of flowers to the widow. It was, it was brutal. So the, the net did not move. That wasn't a thing. And guys didn't crash the net the way they do now. And then they changed it to a, a magnet system, which did not work. If you sneezed on the nets the wrong way, they, they, they slid off the magnets. So now we've got the peg system, which seems to work much better. 
Uh, although there's times where the net comes off a little bit too easily and some buildings they may not have um, as, as good of a system when it comes to the whole icing and if it's not iced properly. But anyways, uh, the nets were fastened at that point and yeah, nobody crashed the net. Don't, don't do it. Not only did Billy Smith try to take your head off, but then the net would finish the job. 1927-28 uh, forward passing was allowed, but only in the neutral and defensive zones. Yeah, so you're trying to come out of your own zone, you better just bring it out because otherwise you had to pass it back. So they finally allowed forward passing in two zones, not the offensive zone. You'll notice that's not there. So 1929-1930, they allowed forward passing in every zone. Problem was this caused a lot of goal scoring because you'll notice offside didn't exist at this point. So you just, just stand right next to the goalie right there. Okay. We'll call him Pavel. Pavel, go stand next to the goalie at the other end of the ice. We'll let you know when the puck's coming down there. Oh, the goals that would have been scored in that system by a Pavel Bury or a Brett Hall. Anyways, uh, forward passing was finally allowed in all three zones in 1929, 1930, as I said. But immediately they noticed a lot of goals being scored. It's a lot. So December 21st of 1929, they made a rule change. For the NHL to make a rule change in the middle of the season, it has to be bad. And so they brought in the offside rule because, yeah, there's way too many goals. If guys are allowed to just go wherever they want, you had to have the blue lines and you had to have the offside. The center ice isn't added, or I should say red line isn't added until 1943-44. Uh, so that's added and that's considered the beginning of the modern era. Now, the two-line pass. You're not allowed to pass from your own zone beyond the red line. You can now. Two line passes allowed. We call it the stretch pass, and it's just it's 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 a given, right? And it was the the red line was taken out for passing in part because of the trap. The neutral zone trap was much easier to enforce and and to really make it imposing when the guys can't pass it from their own zone past the red line. You know that pass has to be before the red line, or they have to to, to rag the puck out themselves, and so it becomes a much more difficult, daunting task. So in two thousand five. They allowed a two-line pass. I always hear about all the points that Wayne Gretzky scored and all, all that era that was so easy to score goals. Okay, take the red line out during that era and tell me how many more points Gretzky would have scored. And I'll tell you, it might have been an extra 50 a year. If the Edmonton Oilers in the 80s didn't have to deal with red line, if they could have had stretch passes, they would have scored about six or seven goals a game. It would have been absolutely ridiculous. In an era where scoring was ridiculous to start with, so the two-line pass from 1943 to 19 or to 2005 is not allowed, and so that's nope, that's two-line pass. That's a whistle puck coming back into your own zone. Uh, and then 1949-1950, this is a brilliant idea. They painted the ice surface white. The ice is not naturally white; it's painted that color. And ice is not. If if you go out in in nature, you'll notice that ice surfaces aren't generally as bright white as they are on TV. And it's done mostly for, for, for TV production, right? And, and just for visibility of the puck. Black on a white ice surface, it works. So it isn't until 1956, 1957 that they introduced the idea that a penalty is over when a goal is scored. So again, where we are now and where we were then, I am sure that in 1956, when this penalty's, you know, okay, it's over because the power play is done because uh, you scored... I'm sure there were those that said, well, wait a minute. Why are you punishing us for having a really effective power play? We scored six seconds into this power play. We can score at least five during this power play. There are people who want to see that rule return, where if, you are, if you're serving a two-minute minor, you're in the box for the whole two minutes. It doesn't matter how many goals they score. I don't, I don't think it'll ever come back, but I, I, it wouldn't necessarily bother me if it did. Uh, I think it it would definitely be a more interesting way of looking at it. You'd have to take power play percentages and change them, though, because it's possible a team could score three times during a two-minute power play and then end up 0 for the other three. So they'd end up, what, 1 for 4? But they scored three goals, so do those count as three power plays? Yeah, so that that's where power play totals might go through the roof because even though it's only one, like a major penalty, right? But yeah, so... I, I wouldn't mind seeing that come back. Guy stays in the box even if they score. 1964-65, this one kind of made me chuckle. No body contact allowed on face-offs. So that's that's just standard. I, I can't imagine, you know, body contact during a face-off. 
there's always been a little bit. Uh, I think it was Joel Otto that used to get accused of headbutting before the puck was dropped. And and there's guys who've been accused of little cheats here and there when it comes to the face-offs. But body contact? I, I can't imagine when it was allowed. How much body contact? Is this like just full-on clothesline to win the face-off? Probably not. That's penalty. But yeah, I thought that was interesting that it's 1964 before they go, we probably shouldn't have body contact during the face-off. What do you guys think? 1966-67, teams must dress two goaltenders. So at one point along here, they said you have to you have to dress or you have to have an emergency backup goaltender ready. But they only had one goaltender. This is this is a lot of this is when you don't have a goaltender with a mask and you don't have a backup. So again, the question might be, well, why don't you guys have a backup goalie? Why would we need one? Well, he's not wearing a mask, so if he gets a puck in the face, ah, we'll just send him for stitches. He'll be fine. Hey, he'll go right back in. Could you put a mask on him? Where are we? France? So like, no, I, I think, and I, I just throw that out there. But yeah, it's 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 bizarre to look back at this now and say, okay, so there was a time when there was only one goaltender. Nobody's wearing a mask. No players are wearing a helmet. Puck had hit a goalie in the face. And, oh, well, all right. Well, stitch that up. Come back. Uh, and then there was also at one point where, you know, a goaltender gets hurt and the coach can pick somebody else to go in the net. All right, uh, Bob, you're in the net. You get in the net. I, I just, I, that would be insane, right? So while we talk about how the emergency backup goaltender, should there be a standard? Does it make a, a mockery of the game? How do you think it worked when, when, uh, Lester Patrick ends up in the net, right? And yet that becomes a folk story. That becomes this big deal, right? So uh, the NHL's definitely had emergency backup goaltender issues before and likely always will. Now, 1967-68, uh, there was a limit on the curve of the sticks. And it started out as an inch and a half curve and it ended up being dropped to a half an inch curve. And this is where, you know, you've got Bobby Hall revolutionizing the game. You've got Stan Makita playing with a pretty straight stick. Uh, and that was the thing, was you had players uh, going with the, the, the pretty major curve so they could get those, those wrist shots and slap shots in. And uh, in the 1950s, Boom Boom Jeffreyon invents the slap shot. At least he's credited with, with inventing the slap shot. Whether or not he took the first one, we don't really have a way to know. But he popularized it. That's the, the nickname Boom Boom. But... It is interesting because this is a point where you've got now guys curving their sticks ridiculously. So the NHL steps in and goes, wait a minute, we got to have a limit on these curves because you, you got to. And I'm looking at you, Bobby Hall, right? So the, the league understands that they've, they've got to have a limit on the curves. But again, if you're a hockey purist, when those curves are coming into the league and you see these guys doing the wrist shots and the, and the slappers and stuff that wasn't done before, I'm sure there would have been some comments and some questions about that at the time. 1979-80. Helmets are mandatory for players entering the NHL. Uh, wearing a cup, that's standard. Pretty much, I would think, throughout. Helmet, protect your head? Eh, we'll think about it. And 1979-80 is where helmets become mandatory. But it's grandfathered in, so if you played before they became mandatory, you didn't have to wear a helmet, Craig McTavish. So, yeah, they became mandatory. And I remember the comments in the mid-80s. I remember, uh, well, there's less respect in the league now because now that everybody wears a helmet, now guys aren't worried about high hits. Guys aren't worried about blasting a puck where it might go a lot higher than it should. They may not have control of it. And the helmets have definitely taken that respect out of the game. So that was there then. 83-84, uh, the five men at overtime is introduced. Uh, the NHL realizes in 83-84 there's too many games going to ties. They had teams with almost 30 ties in seasons. So that's not good enough. And it's 2015-2016 that they went to three-on-three -three overtime, which I think is fantastic. I'm not a huge fan of the shootout. I know there's there's other people who aren't either, but I, I think three-on-three -three overtime is great. I think it's it's a lot of fun to watch. It's very unique, and I think it's a solid way to decide a game. Now, I, I don't think we're going to ever see a point where the overtime period is extended to 10 minutes because I don't think the NHLPA would necessarily want to sign off on that. But I do agree that it's better to solve the game in overtime than it is in a shootout. I will agree with people there. 2000-2001, uh, the NHL brings in the two-referee system as the standard. So they had tested it. I thought it was kind of a mess at first. I remember thinking, well, that's an extra body on the ice. 
that's uh, that's going to cause more pucks to go off of officials. And it's going to cause more issues. And I don't know, you're going to have one referee calling this, this at this standard and this referee calling it another standard. But honestly, it's become it's become pretty good. Uh, I, I, I don't think we ever would go back to the one referee system. And I, I think the two referee systems work pretty well. Also, visors became mandatory in 2013, 2014. Again, they're grandfathered in. The comments with visors was they're going to cause a lot more high sticks. There's going to be a lot more of the general stick work when it comes to hockey players because there's everybody's wearing a visor. And I, I don't think that's really been the case. I think when we look at dangerous stick swinging incidents, I don't think they're any more common now than they were in, say, the 80s or the 90s. And so, yeah, visors being mandatory, I don't think has been been an issue. Uh, and I, I don't know how many eyes it saved either, but I think it saved a few. And if it saved a few, then it's definitely worth it. Uh, but yeah, so what's interesting too is that the game does change. So I, I just went by goal scoring and by save percentage to show the difference. So right now for this season, as of yesterday, and this is before last night's games, goals per game, teams are scoring 2.99 goals per game. Their save percentage averages out to 912. 10 years prior, 2011-2012, 2.73 goals per game were being scored by each team, and 914 is the safe percentage league wide. And that's the highest number on the board. 2001 2002, 2.62 goals are being scored per game by each team, 908 safe percentage, which tells you that less goals are being scored, but there were also less shots because the safe percentage was lower. 1991 92, 3.48 goals scored per game by each team. 888 safe percentage around the league. 1981-82, uh, 4.01 goals scored per game is the average by each team. 873 safe percentage. But then for everybody who wants to say, well, it was just the goaltending was bad, the game was different. 1971-72, 3.07 goals were being scored per game by each team, and safe percentage was 903. So safe percentages had been a, been above 900 in in previous seasons. Just 81, 82, it was a track meet. It was it was absolutely bonkers. And again, that's without the two line pass. If you'd allowed a two line pass, it would have been even more crazy. The game is has changed all the way through. And if you set up a, a, an arena right now, and I think this would be kind of fun, set up an arena right now to look exactly like it would have back at the NHL's inception. So don't paint the ice white, no lines on the ice, and ha find find a way to figure out you know how to, how to get nets that actually are historically accurate to what they were back then. Give everybody the sticks they played with back then and see what the game looks like. I think that'd be a lot of fun, but safety equipment should still be the modern safety equipment because let's be real here. But I, I, I will say the game has changed a lot. The game will continue to change and there will always be very vocal uh, fans, very vocal coaches, players, and former players, coaches, general managers, owners, you name it, who will not like the changes. Um, you know, Con Smythe, I think if he was still around today, Con Smythe would definitely rail against a lot of the changes in the game. And I, I think that that's just, that's how that works. Uh, the game evolves, it evolves for the generation that comes after, and it'll continue to do that. So let me know your thoughts in the comment section below as always. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe if you're browsing your way through you just happen upon this video. Thank you guys so much for watching, for all your support. I will talk to you again soon.